Good to be here with you this morning. Good to see you here. And uh, we're going to pray. Do remember that yesterday was not Halloween. It was Reformation Day. So if anything about Luther bleeds into my message today, that's why. Because I've been reading quite a bit about Luther and the Reformation and all that was involved and what a what a amazing thing that was. Martin Lloyd Jones has a <clears throat> chapter on the history of the Reformation in his book uh, Knowing the Times. And he covers worth reading. And uh, he and J. I. Packer both called Martin Luther a volcano. And uh, surely he was a volcano, a tornado, a hurricane, a tsunami, an earthquake, whatever you want to call it in the spiritual realm, because he brought a lot of change. Praise the Lord for that. All right, before we get my Bible up, right side up, and I am not used to people seeing my knees while I'm <laughs> preaching, so if they start shaking, it's too bad. It's the way it is. All right, we have a great God, and let's pray to him and ask for his wisdom this morning. Dear Lord, you are a great and mighty God. Lord, you are present everywhere, always the same at the same place. You are all-knowing. You are all-powerful. You're able to do what man can't do, not even close. You're able to do whatever your goodwill wants to do. We praise you for that, Father. We thank you that you are sovereign. You are sovereign over, not only over the souls of men, but also you're sovereign over nations. And as Isaiah declared there, the nations are like dust, like fine dust, like a drip, like nothing and less than nothing. And so, Lord, help us to have that right perspective that time is important to you, but eternity is far more important. Help us to prepare for eternity through your son, Jesus. Lord, we do pray for our church. We pray that you will help us as we move forward, that we might honor you, that we might maintain that high view of God, high view of the gospel, of the cross, of the word of God, Lord, that we might always be committed to the inspiration, inerrancy, infallibility the sufficiency of God's word. Lord, help us to keep that close to our hearts, that you are great and mighty God. Lord, we pray for those who are going through hard times. I think of Joe Maynard as he's still struggling with COVID right now and maybe has had a turn to the worse recently, yesterday or today, whenever, but we pray for Joe. Thank you for others that are going through struggles. Pray that you'll encourage them, strengthen them, uh, help them to have thoughts of you, Lord, that you are able to be trusted. You are worthy of our trust. And we do pray for our nation, even though it is nothing and less than nothing in eternity, in the view of eternity. Yet it is important. We're thankful that we're part of this nation that you raised up in these latter days. We thank you for the freedoms and the privileges that we have. Thank you for uh, the leadership that we have. We pray for those in authority that you will give them strength, help them to do the right thing, say the right thing. We pray for uh, in, on the national level and also on the state and local level. Father, we do pray for these elections coming up on Tuesday that, um, Lord, we, we know what we would like to see, but we know that you're in control of this. And so we commit it to you. We're going to trust you no matter what happens. We know that uh, your, your, your rule, your law rules, your, your, will rules. And so, Lord, we're going to trust you for that. And we do want to thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, Carter Taylor and his life devoted to policing, policemen, being a policeman. And we pray for Jacob and others that are also uh, serving us through the rule of law. Lord, we pray that that rule of law would continue in our nation. Thank you for our time now in your word. Open our hearts to it. In your name I pray. Amen. All right. This is exciting time. Colossians, the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2 are perfect for today and next week. This is the second to the last day in this building. Next week is the last day in this building. Then we bold bur go into, uh, what's the name of that? Bayard Park and Weinbach. And we'll see what happens there. 
It's exciting to be part of a new church. We want to do the right thing. As John has already mentioned, we want to make sure that we are walking with the Lord. Uh, but we want to know what we're after. That's what my message this morning is about. What, what are we after? What, what's it all about? What is God's will for Evansville Bible Church? And I don't know of a better description of what God's will is or what we're after than what we're going to look at this morning at the end of this chapter in Colossians. Paul lays out for us in this section the gold standard of a biblical Christ-honoring ministry. And we have it right here. We have it right now. And we want to follow it. We don't take our cues from the godless culture. We don't, we're not about trying to be popular or attractive uh, or even relevant to this world. This world hates Christ. How could we be relevant to a world that hates Christ? We want to take our cues from Paul, the apostle, who took his cues from Christ and ultimately from God. Now, uh, in this passage, it's obviously Paul is talking, beginning with verse 24. We'll get to it here. But I picture Paul here at the front of a long line of volcanoes, a long line of great men and women too, missionaries, disciples, down through the centuries. There's Paul at the beginning of this long line, and with him are Timothy and Titus, and of course Peter and others of the first century, but then along came Polycarp and Athanasius and so on, and then we jump up. Uh, there's about a thousand years there of pretty much darkness, although God never did quit building his church. He always builds his church, no matter what's going on in the culture and in the nations. But we jump up and we get up to the, 16th, the 1500s, the 16th century, 1517. We come up to Martin Luther, that volcano who nailed those 95 theses on the Wittenberg Chapel door. And along with him, he started something. I picture it like this. If you think of the world, you think of Germany, you think of darkness because that's pretty much what it was. People went to church, had no clue what the man was talking about because he was speaking in Latin and they didn't know a thing about Latin. All they saw was his back as he was doing this this uh, abracadabra stuff with so-called mass. But uh, here comes Luther, and I look at it almost like God sent a, a lightning bolt down there into Wittenberg and got Luther aware of what the gospel was all about, and that began to spread, and it spread over to Calvin and up to John Knox and into England and over to America, and we are living in the, in the wake of, and we are part of, the great truths of the Reformation. It's a great story, and, it's, and we're part of it. That's what's exciting to me. As you come down through those centuries, Calvin and Luther and Knox, they were in the 1500s. You come to the Puritans of the 1600s and in the 1700s, although things got horrible in England, God raised up John Wesley and George Whitfield, the Great Awakeners, and you had that Great Awakening. And then into the 1800s, you had the great preachers, Spurgeon, Whose, whose sermons went out throughout the whole world. And uh, by the way, I forgot to mention Jonathan Edwards, excuse me, John, but he was in the uh, 1700s also, of course, part of that Great Awakening. But then you come into the 1900s and you have the great fundamentalist movement in the beginning of this century or the last century. And uh, coming up through, we have all kinds of things. We'll talk about some of that later on. We get into Colossians 2 as to what we have been dealing with. But anyway, it is exciting. It's exciting to be a part of God's people, God's people who have, who God has worked in their hearts, given us the faith to believe, the confidence in the word of God. And here we are gathered on a Sunday afternoon to listen to the word of God. Now, at the beginning of that long line, as I said at the beginning there, there's that little bow-legged, long-nosed Jew who is the Apostle Paul. Now, we don't know what he really looked like. He may have looked like that. But we do know one thing about him, that he was all about a Christ-honoring ministry, and that's what we're going to look at here in a moment. He set the gold standard for, mis for ministry. The Apostle Paul set the gold standard for ministry. I'm calling this message marks of a Christ-honoring ministry, but Paul loved Jesus Christ, and his goal was to honor Christ and to serve the body of Christ. That was his two-pronged goal in life. I, I watched a documentary just the other week of Bob Hope. Some of you don't even know who Bob Hope was, but Bob Hope. I mean, a guy lived to be 100 years old, traveled all over the world, and in that documentary, 
it was the, the point was made that his whole purpose in life was to make people laugh. I thought, oh my goodness, what a poor purpose in life to make people laugh. The Apostle Paul would say, my great goal purpose is to preach Christ and pour myself into serving the body of Christ. There is no higher privilege. And Paul wouldn't have exchanged it for the world, even though it did cost him his life. But here again, we're talking about the gold standard of what Christ honoring ministry looks like. So I've got five marks in verses 24 down to the end, verse 29. Five marks of a God, Christ honoring ministry, which is what we're about. That's what, what we're after is a Christ honoring ministry. So we want Evansville Bible Church to be. First of all, in verse 24, the joy in suffering. Reading along with me. Now I rejoice, says Paul, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, that is the church of Colossae, but also the universal church, the church in the world. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, his body, which is, is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Paul found great joy in ministering Christ to others in spite of the hardship that came his way. Does that surprise you about the Apostle Paul? He is all about rejoicing all the time. We already saw it in Colossians earlier. He is always rejoicing and he's urging you and me to be joyful. He doesn't say, I rejoice for my sufferings. He's not like, yeah, bring on the suffering so I can rejoice more. No, no. he's saying, I rejoice in the sufferings because he's serving, the, he's serving Christ and he's serving the body of Christ. And you think about Paul and his ministry and Acts. Everywhere he goes, people are harassing him. If they aren't stoning him, they're dragging him before the local courts. They're charging him with stirring up a revolution. They're throwing him into jail. But he rejoiced at the privilege of suffering for Christ. Joy, even in suffering, is a key mark of a Christ-honoring ministry. Now, as we saw in this video, we, don't, we know nothing of this. We know nothing of this right now. But what may come, we don't know. What may happen, we don't know. But no matter how hard it gets, how many people turn against you and me, the church, no matter what the government does to persecute the church, and I think you and I, we're feeling the water heating up. It's, it's not boiling yet, but it's getting hotter because those in authority now are those that grew up in the 60s and the 70s, and now they're in high positions of authority. They hate Christianity. It's the one thing that holds this country back from where they want it to go. And so they hate the church, and we're going to have to deal with that, whether in my lifetime or in yours we don't know that. But anyway, Paul says, uh, keep on, I keep on rejoicing and, and feeding the church all these great truths of Christ and what it means to be a believer. That's what Paul's up there in Colossians, up in there in Rome, excuse me. That's what he's doing up there. He's up there writing this letter, telling them how much he rejoices in, in uh, serving them. But notice, though, in that same verse... Let's not get past that verse. Look at the end of that verse. Uh, I do in, I, in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. What does that mean? He is filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. I mean, what could that possibly mean? Well, we know what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that by Paul suffering, he was earning merits to be thrown into the treasury of merit that Roman Catholicism holds to, the treasury of merit that holds all of Christ's merit, and then all the merits of the saints that do more than enough to get to heaven, their merits go in there. And so he's like filling up these afflictions of Christ, giving us more. No, it's not, got nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with adding to the effectiveness of the cross of Jesus Christ. It's not adding to the atonement. It's not uh, in any way, it has nothing to do with good works. 
Christ's, cross, Christ's work on the cross was sufficient and final to save his people to the uttermost. What's he talking about? He's talking about this, and it's really simple, but it's true. Paul is talking about the afflictions that Christ said we would suffer in this world. He said, they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And so Paul is saying, hey, I'm doing my part. I'm, I'm taking these sufferings that Jesus said we were going to experience 1 Peter 4.13 says, to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, and of course your sufferings have nothing to do with salvation, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. So the first mark of a Christ-honoring ministry is joy even when it means suffering, and that's for you and for me. Not walking around like we just bit on a piece of glass or something. That's not going to be attractive to anybody that God might be working in to draw them to Christ. No. Rejoicing in the, the, uh, the gospel and even when it's hard. Along with this joy, number two, is this compelling sense of God's calling or stewardship in the body of Christ. Faithful to your stewardship. Verse 25. And by the way, this means you too, not me only. Okay? We'll see that in here in just a minute. Of this church, Paul says, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit. By the way, bestowed has the idea of entrusted to me, given to me, entrusted to me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. One of the marks of a Christ-honoring ministry is to be faithful to the ministry, to, to the stewardship that God has given us. Now, there are two words that I want you to see in that verse. The first one is minister. See that word minister? And you also see it if you have your Bible. You see it at the end of verse 23, that he is a minister for the gospel. Minister. What does that word mean? Well, there's nothing high and mighty about it. <laughs> minister is uh, the Greek word diakonos, diakonos. Of course, we get our word deacon from it, but there's nothing high and mighty about that word. Diakonos, minister. It means you're, you're serving someone else. You're serving, the word literally was used of waiters, servers at, at a table, or even cleaning up the mess that remained after the people left. You, you, you were table cleaners. You were table servers. You were doing whatever it took, and that's what... A church that honors the Lord will do. We have here, however many numbers we have right here, right now, we have that many servers, servants, ministers. And that's exciting because guess what? We got a lot of work to do. <laughs> we're going to go over to that building over there and there's going to be, it's going to take some work cleaning it up and figuring out what we're doing and putting chairs over here and over there. And, and it might be, you know, I remember when I first church, my I only, I was, this is my third church now. Okay. Uh, the first one though, you know, I was the only leader there at that time. And uh, we had a Christian school. And, you know, when you're a minister, when you're a server, a minister, you got to do whatever it takes. Whatever happens, you got to clean it up. So the toilet overflows, which it did. It was way down in the basement. Toilet overflows. You know what's everywhere. And guess who gets to clean it up? The minister. The server. And so you might be in a situation where you might have to serve in that way. Not a problem. The second word that Paul uses in verse 25 is that word stewardship. Stewardship. A steward. Now, what is that? We use it for, you know, giving, your stewardship of your giving and stewardship. What it really means, a steward is someone who takes care of someone else's property. Someone, someone else owns the property and they hire you to take care of it. It's Joseph down in Egypt. When he went into Potiphar's house, Potiphar noticed that he was a man of character. So he made him a steward over his whole household there. And Joseph did a good, good job. He even resisted um, you know, adultery with Mrs. Potiphar and so on. But a steward is someone who is a manager. It's a position of great trust and responsibility. Paul says his stewardship was entrusted to him for the sake of the church. 
1 Corinthians 4, 2 says a steward, same word. It's a Greek word, oikonomos, house law. How, the guy that is in charge of what's going on there for the owner. Uh, in in uh, 1 Peter 4, 11, as each one, and now here, here, here's where you come in. Okay? You come in. As each one has received a gift, spiritual gift, we've all received spiritual gifts of one sort or another, as each one has received a spiritual gift, let him, I have this memorized, but just in case, employ it in serving, diakoneo is the verb, in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So you are not only a minister, but you are a steward for God. If you belong to Christ, you know, if you belong to the Lord, you know Christ, then you are a minister and you are a steward. So what did this stewardship involve for Paul? What is Paul doing up there in Rome? What's he doing? Well, what's he not doing? He's not up there in prison writing books about this. He's not up there in Rome, I want you to get this. He's not up there in Rome writing books about the systemic injustice of the Romans. He isn't calling on Christians to march on Rome to force the authorities to release him. Think about it. What's he doing up there in prison? He's not writing about the problem of Greek privilege. And he's not writing about the problem of Roman fragility. And he's not lamenting his Jewishness because the Jews always thought poorly of the Gentiles. And so now he's lamenting his Jewishness. None of that. What is he doing? Look what it says in that verse. So that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. He is up there feeding the church, feeding the church all these great truths of Christ and what it means to be a believer. That's the major ministry that God has called us to. And so how did he go about it? Look what it says, by fully carrying out the preaching of the word of God. Well, what in the world does that mean? This is really good. By fully carrying out the preaching of the word of God, fulfilling the word of God. Hmm. This is good. What he means is this. He is not up there shaving off the sharper edges of God's revelation so that people will receive it better. No. He's not softening the message up there in Rome. He's going to say some pretty hard things coming up here in chapter 2 of Colossians. You remember Micaiah in 1 Kings 22? I haven't preached about him for so long, I almost forgot about him. But 1 Kings 22 is worth your reading. But Ahab wants to fight against Ramoth Gilead. He called, I think, Jehoshaphat to come up from the south to join him. But he wanted the assurance of success. He didn't want to go out there and be beat. So all his fawning toady prophets got in front of him and said, Go, O Ahab, you will win. Go, you will have success. Go, go, God says, I just got a message from God. You're going to win. Ahab knew they were fawning toadies. So he said, Is there a prophet here of the Lord somewhere? And someone said, Yeah, there's Micaiah, but he never tells you what you want to hear. He says, Go get him. So the messenger runs down to where Micaiah is, the messenger runs in there and he says, Micaiah, Ahab wants you to come and prophesy about Ramoth Gilead, but Micaiah, I want you to know something. All the prophets agree, they all are of one mind here, that Ahab is going to win. So when you get up there, you make sure that you tell Ahab what he wants to hear. He likes his ears tickled. And here's what, I'm not going any further except to, hear, to say this. Here's what Micaiah said in verse 14. Quote, as the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I shall speak. And that is a great 
word from the word of God. And so for Paul, fulfilling the word of God means fully carrying out what God has said, preaching the word, holding nothing back, hiding nothing, changing nothing. It may be offensive to people. And, you know, as a pastor, I've had people tell me, hey, uh, don't talk about Roman Catholicism today because I've got a Roman Catholic friend coming in and man, I don't want her to hear that. Okay. Uh, don't talk about X, Y, Z, your favorite sin, you know, because I've got a no, that's not how it works. That's not how Paul did church. That's not how we do church. Not that we're nasty or anything. In fact, we're quite nice, aren't we? I think. It may be offensive to people. It doesn't matter. Don't shape the message to make it culturally relevant. Here, it may rub people's fur the wrong way. But. Like one old preacher said, and some of you heard this already, this illustration. But like one old preacher said, well, then let the people turn around. Think about that for a while. This is a huge part of the gold standard of Christ's honoring ministry. Faithful to fulfill the word of God, whatever God says that we must speak and preach it with authority. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul told his disciple Timothy, preach the word, be constant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and patience, because the time's going to come when people are going to turn away from the truth. They want their ears tickled, but you be sober in all things. Fulfill your ministry. Don't cave. That's what we're committed to for the benefit of the church. The third mark of a Christ honoring ministry is joyful when we suffer, faithful to our calling to the ministry. Number three, Exalting Christ, or if I had the time to do it again, I probably would have changed that title to Unfolding God's Mystery, because God's mystery is Christ. But look at Colossians 1, 26 and 27. That is, he's talking about preaching the, the full counsel of God uh, from the previous verse. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now has been manifested to his saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, a mystery in the New Testament, and there are, there's probably about 10 of them if you use a concordance. I'm not going into them. But a mystery in the New Testament is, is a truth that humans could, would never have come up with. A mystery in the New Testament is not some woo 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 thing. A mystery in the New Testament is a truth that only God could reveal. And the, and the mystery that God revealed here is that Jews and Gentiles, at least this is part of it, Jews and Gentiles have the same footing, the same standing before God. Before God's focus was on Israel and the Gentiles had to become Jews and we see this struggle in the book of Acts. You see it in Acts 15. You see it in, in the book of Galatians. Remember, those Christian Jews said, wait a minute, these Gentile Jews need to be circumcised. Paul says, no, the mystery that God has revealed is that Gentile and Jew are on equal footing in the church of Jesus Christ. And this was huge. Paul could go from one city to another Asia Minor, up into Greece, up into Thessalonica, and so on. One, one town after another, and assure those Gentiles that they are on, if they come to Christ, they are on equal footing with the Jews. And guess what the Jews didn't appreciate? Him saying that. And that's why many times the Jews ran him out of town. They're saying, you mean we're equal with the Gentiles? Forget about it, man. We're out of here. You're out of here. You know, put him in jail, whatever it takes. Stone him, which is what they did in certain cases. Unfolding God's great mystery. But it goes further than that equality of Jew and Gentile. It goes to the fact that Christ, as he says in verse 27, this mystery among the Gentiles, emphasis on the Gentiles there, which is Christ in you. Now, there is more in that three-word phrase than I could ever preach about and probably anybody could write it. Christ in, 
We know that Christ, that we're in Christ. We know that. But he's saying Christ is in us. Christ in you. The hope of glory. That's just amazing. That Christ would not only be with you, but live in you. Even though you, and we probably don't have any Jews here, unless maybe historically, whatever, forget it. Um, but we have Gentiles here. Christ lives in you, even though you are a filthy, dirty, ceremonially unclean, bacon-eating, ham-chewing Gentile. Ugh, the Jews would say, ugh. It almost make them vomit thinking of this filth. And Christ, the Messiah, is in them, in the Gentiles. What an amazing thing. God's mystery revealed is that Christ would live in Gentiles. This is the great mystery that Paul rejoices in. Christ in you. You know, he says that in Galatians 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not Christ, yet not I, but Christ liveth. Christ in me, Christ liveth in me, Christ liveth in me, Christ liveth in me. Have, are you familiar with the song, Christ liveth in me, Christ liveth in me? Oh, what a salvation this, that Christ liveth in me. That means that Christ is your sufficiency. This is worth talking about, an assuring truth, Christ in me. So when Christ is in that boat... And the Sea of Galilee, when he's in the boat, so there's the boat, Christ is in the boat, could that boat possibly sink? It wouldn't matter how strong the storm would be. No storm could sink that boat because Christ is in the boat. And the same is true now with you and me. This is great assurance that Christ is in me. When I die, where is Christ? He's in me. I don't understand all that, but wherever I am, there Christ is. I think Paul uses that to exhort the Corinthians. You know, if you go into a prostitute, you're taking Christ into a prostitute because Christ is in you. Christ liveth in me. And then he says, which is your hope of glory. He's your hope of coming glory. If he's in you, when you die, you're going to glory. He's like... Somewhere I've got, he's like the anchor of your soul to eternity since Christ liveth in you. Now, there's tons more in that phrase that I am not able to get into and don't even know how to. Number whatever it is, number four, rejoicing, faithful in your stewardship, rejoicing in the mystery, exalting Christ. Number four is building up God's people. This is what we're about. This is all about what we're about as a, as a church. Because we're about what Paul's about. And what I've just talked to you about is what Paul's about. So we want to be what Paul's about. And what is Paul about? All these things. But this one, especially building up God's people. That's what Paul delighted to do. Building up the people of God. And there are uh, five key elements there. I don't want you to get confused here. But this is under building up God's people. What does Paul say? How do we do that? How do we build people up? How does Paul build? Number one, Paul proclaimed a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Look at verse 28. We proclaim him. We proclaim Christ. We don't proclaim Darwin or Marx or Freud or any human being. We proclaim Christ. That's what it's all about. People are on their way to hell. They're sinners and they need to hear about Christ in all of his grand person, the God-man, and all of his great work on the cross, all of his promises about his coming. He's prophet, priest, and king, and so on. We preach Christ. We preach Christ. Number two, we build up every believer. I didn't read that verse. I want to read verse 28, and while I'm reading it, Track with me there and tell me how many times every man appears in that one verse. Check it out. We proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. How many times was that? Three times. Every man. We build up every man. Nobody 
is in the stands here. Of course, you can't use this illustration today because <clears throat> nobody's in the stands on the football team either, but in the football game, any, I never have those cutouts. What is that all about? Did serious adults actually do that? Blows me away. But nobody in the stands on this deal. Everybody's on the field. Everybody, you're an end, you're, you're, you're a running back, you're, you're a tackle, you're something. You're in the game. Every man. And he, Paul uses the Greek word anthropos. And I know we've got some Greek scholars here. So anthropos, it's generic name for a human being, a man. So it's not just gender man. It's men, women, boys, girls. Every man, three times he emphasizes that. And I think that's just wonderful. If you're a Christian, then all the truth of God's word is to build you up in the faith and mature you and equip you. And then number three, and number three, uh, three and four go together. There's two words here that are just defining for ministry. And that first one is admonishing. Admonishing. We admonish every man. Admonish means we tell people what God says. We take God's word and we tell them what it says. And maybe they're going the wrong direction. They need to be warned. They're admonished. It's the word that Jay Adams used for his whole movement of neuthetic counseling. It's that word neuthetic. It's placing it in the mind. It's taking God's word and positively teaching it. But that comes next. But it's warning people. And Paul met with the Ephesian elders for three years. And he says, I cease not to admonish you day and night. Telling you who God is, who you are, what God calls you to do. You're going the wrong way over there, brother. Come back this way. Admonish. We need to be willing to be admonished, but sometimes we admonish others. We do it like a father does his son if he's a good father. It's a family word. It has the, and it's used of that. I think even in, well, it's used in Ephesians that way. Parents, uh, uh, bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Showing them the right way to go. And then, that's number three, we admonish. And then we teach every believer with all wisdom. That's what he says right there. Teaching every man with all wisdom. Do you wonder why we keep on digging into the word and bringing it out and trying to unpack it so we can see what it says and how it applies? That's what we do. We got one book, only one. We dig into it. Now, if you're a Sunday school teacher, you're digging into it. Or if you're a Small group leader, you're digging into it. If you're a preacher, of course, you're digging into it. And let me give you a couple of words here. We dig into it. That, that, has, that word means, is the Greek word exegesis. We go into the word and pull out what the word says. I think I mentioned this earlier a few weeks ago. We don't eisegesis, and that is come up with some thoughts of our own and then look to the Bible to try to figure out where, where the Bible might support my thoughts. That's eisegesis. That is not exegesis. We dig in, we bring it out, and then we got it out there. And really, in one sense, that's not that hard. You know, most of the Bible is fairly easy to understand. I mean, there's some tough parts. But now we got it out there. And if, you, if you're a preacher and you've prepared sermons, you know you got tons of pages of notes. And now i got to take all this and, you know, make, bring order to chaos, I guess you might say. And exposit it. Expositional preaching. Exposing it. Placing it out there. That's what expository preaching is all about. That's what I'm doing right now. This is expository preaching. You're taking what's in the Word and you're exposing it. To the people that need to hear it. Ex, uh, admonition and then teaching. That's the next one. I'm gonna, we're on teaching right now. Teaching. So much to learn. All kinds of stuff. Doctrine. Uh, the whole Bible. Genesis to Revelation. And we're going to do it with all wisdom. And I think with all wisdom means that we aren't idiots about <laughs> wisdom. You know, God's wisdom. We, it's God's word, of course. But, you know, you don't, you don't dump a whole truckload of truth on this poor guy that you're meeting with. You give it the whole thing to him at one time. He's going like, man, I can never get my arms around that. You got to divide it up a little bit. Jesus said, you know, I got many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. You gotta, you gotta, I'm going to give them to you, but you're, you'll have to wait a little while. And so you, 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 uh, you're, you use wisdom in teaching. So what does all this mean? How does all this happen? It starts in the public ministry of the word right here on Sundays. We're here because this is God's plan and will for his people. That's why we're here. We didn't just all of a sudden say, hey, let's have a meeting down there on Bakey Road. That'd be cool. Let's do something. What are we going to do over there? Let's have some punch. Yeah, it's not what it's about. 
We're here because this is the public ministry of the word on Sundays. We've chosen Sundays. We're here because this is God's plan. We're we're to gather together for instruction and and to admonish and encourage one another to love and good works. It happens in Sunday school classes. It's, It's what small groups are all about. It happens when you give biblical counsel to a struggling friend. When you exhort others to be faithful, to read the word, to spend time praying, to hear the word. You may choose a book of the Bible and arrange to meet with somebody. Let's go through that book of Romans or Galatians or whatever. Or you, maybe you're going to choose a book, a good, godly, biblically sound book. Careful, check the author out. We, if, you, if you are, seriously, here's a word of admonition. If you choose a book, check out the author. Who is the author? You want to know where they're coming from. That's very important. Just because the vineyard has it on their shelves doesn't mean it's going to be good. All right. Finally, I'm getting hot up here. Are you getting hot? Man, the fifth mark. Now, we're away from those uh, things I just went over under... uh, Building up God's people. The fifth mark, and finally, laboring in God's strength. But look what Paul says here. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power which mightily works within me. Paul wasn't lazy. He was a worker. Christ's honoring ministry is work. You know, there's times I'd much rather go mow the yard than sit down there for three more hours and try to figure out what Paul's saying in this passage. There's some things that are easier than work. Paul labored. He says, I labor. And then he says, I strive. That word strive is agonizomai. It's a Greek word. Agonize. It just means uh, serious, hard work. So if you're in, in ministry, which you are, but if you're in a teaching kind of ministry, listen. Okay, we got the Sunday school coming. This is a great time for this. We got Sunday school coming, right? Have you ever been like many Sunday school teachers, especially if you're teaching like junior age boys? They're the best to teach, by the way. If you can teach junior age kids, then you can probably preach. Because if you can communicate it to them, you can communicate it to older people. They're just grown up kids. But, um, Tasha, what was I going to say? You need to be, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're on the way to, you're, you're on the way to church. It takes you 15 minutes to get to church. Oh, I'm teaching that class this morning. Take about, you know, eight minutes to look over the lesson. You get in there. Are you prepared? Come on. You got to take some time on Saturday. At least read about it. Read whatever the word says about it. Get in there and do it. Not that it's burdensome, but it is labor. It's hard sometimes. Cutting out the time. But Paul says, I labor and I agonize. But then he adds this, and I love this. According to God's power energizing him. How did Paul do that? He worked hard, no question about it. Worked harder than I do, I'm sure of that. But what did he do? He, he, he knew what he was supposed to do, write this book of Colossae, so he prayed, Lord, I need your strength here. I am, without you, I can do nothing. Help me, help me to do the best I can. I'll give you all the glory, and that's what it's about giving God all the glory. 1 Peter 5.10, I think 5.10, I believe it is. Whoever serves, let him do so as the strength. No, it's 11. Whoever serves, let him do so as by the strength which God supplies so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So when it's all said and done, any good done in your ministry or mine, God gets all the credit. This passage is the gold standard for ministry. Paul loved Christ. He loved the body of Christ. He found great joy in serving that body, seeing God's people grow and change. Let me ask you just a few personal questions. Do you love Christ? Do you love Christ? He loved you and gave himself. I love that song, The Love of God. That's that's been one of my favorites. It's wonderful. Do you love Christ? Do you love Christ's body? Do you love the people of God? You know, you're in the body of Christ. God reconciled you to himself through Christ. And when he reconciled you, and I think, um, Adam, Blake, I mean, <laughs> Adam, Blake mentioned this last week. 
when God reconciles us to himself, then he, at the same time, ipso facto, we're all reconciled to one another. We don't go out there and try to achieve some kind of reconciliation. We are reconciled to one another. We love one another. Do you love the body of Christ? Do you love the people of God? Is there any way that you could be discipling others even right now? You might be amazed. You might say, oh, yeah, that's right. There is that one person that I could maybe ask about going through a book of the Bible or, or a good book. Will you ask God about this? Are you excited about a ministry that emphasizes the admonishing and teaching ministry of God's word, like it says in Colossians 1.28? By the way, that verse has always been a defining verse for me in terms of ministry. Admonishing and teaching. That's what we do. Proclaim him, admonishing and teaching with all wisdom. Perhaps you aren't really a believer. You have just heard God assuring sinners, just like us, that Christ will come and dwell in any sinner who turns to Christ. Is Christ in you? Ask yourself that question. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Apostle Paul. Thank you for this little book of Colossians, giving us this gold standard for what ministry really looks like. Lord, may our church look like this. We fail, we mess up. We don't do it perfectly for sure by a long shot. But Lord, we, get, we got our marching orders here. We know what a Christ-honoring ministry looks like. We need to ex elevate Christ, exalt the word of God, ministry, the church of Jesus Christ, through it all that you would be honored and glorified. In your name I pray, amen.